Hi, Andy. Hi, Victoria. So today we will have a special episode dedicated to answering our listeners' questions. Mm -hmm. We have had hundreds of questions. And of course, as you all know, this cannot be medical advice as we haven't seen you or examined you, and we really don't know the particulars of your situation. Also, we received a lot of rheumatology questions, and we're about to have an episode in which we will have one of our rheumatology graduates joining us on the podcast. So we're going to put those off to that episode. Okay. Andy, quite a few of the questions were focused on diet. So let's mm -hmm. begin there. All right. Alana from Perth, Australia says, I'm really confused about what is ultimately the best diet for our bodies. <laughs> on the one hand, I hear Dave Asprey telling me to go keto for longevity. And on the other hand, I hear that veganism is the way to go for anti-inflammatory reasons. I have two kids and I'd love to know what you would suggest for the whole family. And then she throws in that a couple of us have anxiety and gluten intolerances. <laughs> well, I'm not surprised <laughs> that she's confused. Yeah. Uh, I'm really, uh, I think, alarmed and dismayed by the profusion of what I think are uh, really nutty diets out there, a lot that are extremely restrictive and um, throw whole macronutrients under the bus um, or exclude uh, foods like beans that I think are extremely good foods for people. I don't know that there's one right answer to that. I think it, I, I would start by saying what it's best not to eat. And I think what's most clear is that we want to avoid uh, refined, processed, and manufactured foods. I think that's what's causing most of the harm. And Victoria, you just sent me an article that looked at the some of the dangers of ultra-processed foods, which looked you know, even more significant than diets that were heavy in animal products. Do you want to say something about that? Uh, sure. It was a really interesting follow-up to the um, Adventist study, which we have been following for years. Uh, people who follow the religious practice Seventh-day Adventists are often vegetarians. And, you know, they've notably been very healthy with uh, less of the chronic diseases that plague Americans at large. But this study looked at, was it the restriction of not eating animal products that made the difference? And actually, it appeared that ultra processed food may have explained the vast majority of the health difference uh, with meat in particular being the one other factor. So red meat, not poultry, not pork, but red meat in particular that was associated with increased mortality. But the biggest risk factor, as you said, was the ultra processed food. So I would say the, the main generalization that I would make is to try to avoid refined processed and manufactured foods, to eat foods as, as much as you can that are as close to the way nature produces them as possible. I wanted to push you a little bit about the keto diet, because as you know, keto, paleo, they've been so popular. And while I would not think about them as a broad public health recommendation, in some cases, they could be a therapeutic diet, for example, right, someone with think, diabetes. Yeah. So I think those are very special applications, but I don't think that they're wise as uh, general diets for most people. I, I would also say, you know, I don't tell people to become vegans or complete vegetarians, but I think it is good to eat what some people call a plant forward diet. Uh, that is, I think we should be eating a lot of high quality produce, especially vegetables. I think it is good to reduce the percentage of animal foods in the diet. And of the animal foods out there, beef is probably the worst in terms both of its effects on health and effects on the environment. I think it's good to eat lower on the food chain. So that means eating fish, maybe shellfish even better. You know, there's a push now to look at foods made from insects, which might be have a much better impact on environmental health. We'll see. I think it is good to eat a, a variety of herbs and spices and beverages. I think all of these things uh, have uh, unique protective compounds in them that are good for us. It's probably good to avoid sweetened liquids as much as possible. 
you know, not just soda, but also fruit juice and energy drinks and putting sugar in coffee and tea. Uh, you know, those are some some broad generalizations that that I I think I feel good about making. I think it's good to include fermented foods in the diet, and we know how good they are for the for the microbiome. Yeah, so I'm going to ask you a few follow-up questions about some of that because some of our uh, listeners have asked, but I'm going to push you a little bit more on the vegan diet, which uh, Alana had asked about because another listener said, do you think that a vegan diet is healthy? Is it sustainable in the long term? And to what extent does it require supplementation? In other words, what nutrients are just hard to get from plants? I think a vegan diet can be healthy, but it takes some care and attention. And especially if you're trying to raise vegan kids, I think you have to be careful. So uh, it is possible to have nutritional deficiencies on a vegan diet. I think especially for omega-3 fatty acids, for vitamin B12, uh, for iron, for calcium. Uh, what else, Victoria, would you say? Well, I think I'd also worried about vitamin D3. Yes. Um, maybe creatine. You know, I was, mm -hmm. some of these nutrients, I think we're still learning um, how supplementation may be important. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, there are a lot of vegans out there and, mm -hmm. and some of them are healthy. I also meet uh, vegans whose idea or vegetarians whose idea of, uh, you know, doing that is eating macaroni and cheese three times a day or, you know, something like that, which is not a healthy diet. Yeah, definitely not. You mentioned insects and Robert asked about eating insects as a necessary strategy for global food sustainability. He actually mentioned that he had come to one of our nutrition conferences and tasted them for the first time. So I was just wondering, where are you in incorporating insects into your diet? <laughs> well, I may do so unconsciously, <laughs> but, but uh, knowingly, I have not been very good about that. Now, I'm less inclined to go for things like chocolate-covered grasshoppers uh, <laughs> than I would be for products made from flour, for example, uh, made from crickets or, or mealworms that may be good protein sources. You know, we have a, a cultural aversion to eating insects. The yuck uh, factor. The yuck factor. Although, <laughs> you know, anatomically, uh, insects are not all that different from crustaceans that we eat, crabs and lobsters and prawns. So, you know, it is, it is an interesting psychological barrier. But there are many uh, populations that consider insects delicacies, even in uh, Mexico, where uh, grasshoppers are relished and eaten in uh, in tacos and fried, uh, of course, in Africa, where uh, I insects are, you know, greatly enjoyed. I think it's coming. I think that it's going to be forced on us by uh, environmental economic necessity. And I think there probably are going to be palatable foods made from insect derived products that will uh, get around the yuck factor. You know, you mentioned crustaceans. There was a very interesting New York Times article some months ago about how lobster was considered to be a completely unacceptable food. And it was fed to indentured servants who fought a battle and won that they only be forced to accept that as their food three meals a week. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. So things change. Things uh, change, right? Yeah. Another question is about the microbiome, uh, which you mentioned. And one of our listeners asked, what are simple methods to make fermented foods at home? How do they work? And how much fermented food should a person consume daily? Well, first of all, it is very easy to make fermented foods at home. And the basic process is simply uh, either putting vegetables into a brine, a salt water solution, uh, and sealing them away from air or putting them in, in, in just in salt. There's a lot of recipe books out there, a lot of recipes on Google. I make my own sauerkraut. I make uh, pickles. I make kimchi. I've made kvass from beets, which is a very easy thing to make. I think it is good. To, I used to make yogurt a lot. I, I don't haven't done that recently, but it is easy and cheap to make fermented foods at home. And they're delicious. Just look up recipes, get books on it and start doing it. Now, in terms of how much, I think this is a matter of individual taste. One concern is that a lot of these foods are high in sodium. So you might want to be cautious about intake, if you're salt sensitive, you can also rinse uh, fermented foods off to reduce the, the sodium content. 
But other than that, I think, uh, you know, including them on a daily basis is a, is a very good thing to do. I think it's good for general health and certainly good for the gut microbiome. And is variety important? In other words, like say you eat yogurt every day, do you get benefit from adding kimchi or sauerkraut? Or yeah, I think else? there are different cultures in all of these and uh, that that there are probably benefits from different groups of organisms. So I think the greater the variety of organisms, the better. And lots of them are vegetables. So it's another way of getting more exactly. vegetables yep. into your diet. Yep. I uh, experimented with making kombucha during the pandemic, uh -huh. and uh, it was delicious and kind of fun. I know um, you've made pickles. I just want to remind our listeners that not all pickles are alike. <laughs> well, first of all, uh, some pickles are alive and have organisms growing in them, and those are the ones you find in refrigerated sections of supermarkets. But they're also what are called quick pickles, which are made with vinegar, and do, are not cultured products and do not require refrigeration. And probably most experience, people's experience of pickles is with vinegar pickles. Vinegar is acetic acid, which has a different flavor also from lactic acid that's made by the organisms that grow in fermented foods. And to me, the taste of lactic acid is much more appealing. Do you ever worry about too much bacteria or one of these cultures going bad? I think if a culture goes bad, it's pretty obvious. You know, often there'll be a slime that develops on it. It's mm -hmm. foul smelling. Uh, you know, it's pretty obvious. I think that that's really not a concern with the common things that you make. All right. Another diet question, which I know you get asked a lot, but here it is again. I was wondering if you could discuss wheat slash gluten. It's all the hype right now. And as a lay person, I have a hard time discerning scientific fact from fiction. It seems to me that if you include 100% whole grains as part of a balanced diet and you don't have a gluten intolerance or celiac disease, that would be okay. But I'm continuously told not to eat wheat or gluten as it causes inflammation in everybody. As it is a good source of dietary fiber, it would be nice to know how to utilize it or not. Well, that's a complex question. I personally think that wheat is a, a good food. It has sustained life in many parts of the world for millennia. It is possible that we have changed wheat in recent times to make it less healthy or more allergenic, but I don't think there's anything wrong with wheat or grains in general. I think it's what we've, the way we prepare wheat that's a problem for many people. I think uh, when you mill any grain into flour, you turn the starch into a quick digesting product that raises blood sugar, and that can promote inflammation in people. So I think, but eating whole grains or cracked grains is fine. Some people find that they can tolerate ancient forms of wheat, like farro, for example, uh, better than they can modern forms of wheat. Other people who think they have problems with wheat find if they go to Italy or France that they don't have problems with wheat products which suggests it may be something in the way in the types of wheat or the way wheat is grown or contaminants of wheat that may be causing people problems. I mean, obviously, people with celiac disease are in one category. There are people that have wheat allergies. But the large majority of people who are gluten sensitive, this is a often a subjective diagnosis, and it may not have an objective correlation. Uh, I think the only way you can tell is by systematically leaving wheat out, adding it back, see if you make a correlation with symptoms. What do you think about that? Well, I want to say two things. One is that you mentioned there could be a contaminant. And the one I'm most worried about is an herbicide called glyphosate, which is in the product Roundup Ready. And it's often sprayed on conventionally grown wheat because it's a desiccant. And so it makes it easier for the farmers to get the wheat in before a storm happens and the wheat crop is ruined. But that means it's on the food as you know the wheat is milled and turned into flour. So two ways to avoid that are either organic or GMO, because GMO doesn't allow the use of uh, Roundup Ready. So, you know, that's really an interesting thing. You mean GMO to... or non-GMO? Thank you. Non-GMO. Non-GMO, right. Okay. <laughs> that really does then lend itself to 
the anecdotes you hear about why people do better when they're in Europe, because Europe doesn't allow this product to be sprayed. And what, do we know what glyphosate does to us? Isn't there? It has some bad effect on our gut microbiome. Exactly. So they basically say glyphosate doesn't harm humans at all. And that seems to be true, but it does have a direct effect on the bacteria, yeast, fungi, you know, that are in our colons. And so it, it is a hit to the microbiome. And that may be why so many Many people are having trouble tolerating it, you know, on top of a microbiome that already is getting a lot of processed food, not enough fiber, maybe antibiotics that have changed the microbiome. So it could be it just as one more thing that tips us mm -hmm. over the balance. Yep. It's interesting to consider a second thing, which is gluten is obviously a much larger category and includes uh, not just wheat, but also barley and hops. And some people, do fine just eliminating wheat and not the mm -hmm. whole larger category. Mm -hmm. All right, one more diet question, and maybe this isn't really a diet question per se, but a how we eat. And that is one of our listeners asked about how often is it recommended to do intermittent fasting? <laughs> well, I'm going to let you answer that, Victoria. I think there are so many different recommendations out there. There's so many different schedules that people propose for doing intermittent fasting. And I don't know if there's one right way to do it. I think it, 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 this is a very individual matter. Well, I, I agree with you. And some of them are really restrictive. For example, where you only eat in a six hour or an eight hour window each day. And, and those are truly restrictive. And of course, they interfere with the social aspects of eating because you can't share meals with people because you're during your fasting time. Again, I, I see a difference between using this as a therapeutic approach. So someone who has diabetes, it may really be useful to the body to have a long window where the body doesn't have to deal with any incoming food and helps therefore with blood sugar regulation. It similarly appears to be useful for women who've had breast cancer. A 13 hour overnight fast appears to reduce the risk of recurrence, but those are therapeutic uses as opposed to a more everyone should eat this way recommendation. So I think you have to experiment and find out what works for you. I will say some people love this as an approach to keep their weight on target. Uh -huh. uh, it doesn't work for everyone, but for some people, this feels really easy to eat in a narrower window and it seems to have that effect. And I think the other thing that is intriguing is the potential effect on our immune system. Say more about that. Well, the gut has the largest number of immune cells in the body. So again, this concept of putting the gut to rest for mm -hmm. 10, 11, you know, 16 hours in a day may really lead to a reset of the immune system mm -hmm. and be beneficial, especially perhaps for people with autoimmune disease. Yeah, well, we certainly see that, like that correlation with long-term fasting and autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, asthma, ulcerative colitis, which may go into complete remission on long fast. Body of Wonder is produced by the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine at the University of Arizona. Internationally recognized for innovative health and wellness programs, evidence-based research, and clinical standards. The center offers listeners a wide range of free resources to live and maintain a healthy lifestyle, including online learning, meditations, and short videos. To find out more, go to azcim.org slash podcast. That's azcim.org slash podcast. All right, I'm going to move from diet and ask you some other questions. This is a beginner's question about the mind-body connection. Mm -hmm. And our listener says... I am new to your podcast and not as advanced as some people on understanding the mind-body connection. I'd love to hear more about the basics of how the mind affects the body and how it can generate physical symptoms for people in the absence of disease. I'd also like to understand the current medical model in treating symptoms and what's been missing in this mind-body model with the traditional approach. It would also be helpful for us newbies to understand how to start integrating the whole body together? In other words, what steps does one take to connect mind and body? <laughs> All right. My uh, view is that mind and body can only be separated verbally. They are two poles of the same reality. You can't 
separate them. And anything that happens in one sphere happens in the other. So there is a constant interaction between the mind and the body. And it's not just that the mind can generate diseases. Uh, you know, that is one category of things. But whenever there's an event in the body, it's having an impact on the mental sphere and vice versa. And I think medicine should be taking advantage of that connection. I think conventional medicine is greatly limited in its effectiveness by the materialistic paradigm that now dominates Western science and medicine. And in materialist philosophy, all that is real is that which can be seen, measured, touched, that non-physical reality doesn't exist. And non-physical causation of physical events is not allowed for. And that's why medicine has never been able to make sense of wart cures by suggestion and placebo responses and why uh, mind-body methods are so underutilized in conventional medicine. You mentioned autoimmune diseases a little while ago. In that general category of disease, the mind-body interaction hits you in the face. A typical onset of rheumatoid arthritis in a young woman is a flare-up of all joints within 24 hours of a severe emotional trauma. I mean, that's just obvious. And yet, in, room, in conventional rheumatology, mind-body uh, methods are rarely used. We, we bring out immunosuppressive drugs. Uh, you know, we go to those methods, and we don't explore that, the possibility of changing the situation by using mind-body methods. There's a whole array of what we call mind-body therapies, uh, hypnosis, guided imagery, visualization, biofeedback. And these therapies are time-effective, cost-effective. They're even fun, often, for both patient and practitioner. And we don't use them that much. So it, this is an integrated medicine. This is one of our major philosophical planks. And we train practitioners to be aware of and use mind-body methods. My personal experience is that there is no condition which is off-limits to mind-body uh, methods. And we should always be trying these out. Now, there's some art to, to using these because patients are very set to interpret suggestions of this sort as meaning that their diseases are not real or not important or that they're making them all up. And you have to be, you know, delicate in how you present this to patients. You know, you're not you're not saying that their diseases are all caused by the mind. It's just that there's a connection there and you can take advantage of it to promote healing. So one of the messages I get from what you're saying is that the mind-body connection fundamentally trusts that the body is capable of healing and doesn't necessarily need some outside intervention, that there's a inner intervention that could happen. And that is what the placebo response is. You know, it's a pure healing response from within that is mediated by that mind-body connection. And rather than trying to rule that out, we should be trying to make it happen more of the time. One of the strategies I've sometimes used in my integrative medicine practice when someone seems especially sensitive to that notion that this isn't real, you know, if you suggest mind-body interventions is to actually send someone to a practitioner of uh, traditional Chinese medicine because they never did that split. You know, these folks treat the body and those folks treat the mind, but rather there is this more uh, whole person uh, approach. Mm -hmm. Yes, good idea. Okay. I want to ask you a few of our listeners' questions about medicines. The first one is another one I know you get a lot. Is there any hope for people who are trying to taper off benzodiazepines without the debilitating and terrifying withdrawal that happens to many of us who are prescribed benzos? Absolutely possible. It is a very tough withdrawal. It's a difficult problem. Uh, it is a more difficult withdrawal than, than coming off of opioids, but it is certainly doable. I've known many people who have done it. I don't think there's any one right way of doing it. I think, first of all, you you have to have a schedule of tapering off the medication and not hesitate to go back up if if problems persist. You want to be putting in place methods if, if the problem is anxiety that they've been meant to deal with to control anxiety. And as you know, my main recommendation is the 478 
uh, breathing exercise. And uh, in terms of, of supplements, I think kava is by far the, our best ally there. It is the most powerful natural anti-anxiety agent. And you want to remove uh, things that may be contributing to the problem, such as caffeine, uh, making sure that people are trying to get regular sleep and not getting too much stimulation of one sort or another. There are all sorts of methods, hypnosis, acupuncture that can be used to help. But it, it is absolutely important to know that it's possible and doable and just take some time and patience. And people should not start them in the first place yes, because, yes. you know, these are not great <laughs> drugs and they're handed out like candy without any warnings to people of the problems of this kind of addiction. I completely agree. Prevention is key here. <laughs> One thing that I have sometimes recommended is that people actually get a liquid form because yes, at some idea. moment it's too hard to cut it into 18ths and I'm sorry, to eighths and 16ths. And, and it's surprising as you lower the dose sometimes by how small the change has to be mm -hmm. in order to effectively taper mm -hmm. off. Yep. Another question about uh, medication. How can I get off blood pressure medicines even though I live an extremely healthy lifestyle? Well, I'm not sure that it's that important to get off blood pressure medications. You know, unlike benzodiazepines, which have horrible effects on cognition and, and uh, you know, all sorts of other problems, uh, blood pressure medications are very effective. It may be possible to reduce the number of them that you're taking or to reduce dosages, but I don't know that it's such a bad idea to be on blood pressure medication. Uh, you know, it is certainly worth seeing if you can control blood pressure just through lifestyle changes, exercise, uh, autonomic relaxation, cutting sodium and so forth. Uh, but if you can't keep it in the normal range, I think it's okay to use uh, blood pressure medication starting with the the lowest dose of the least potent agent, then you add more if necessary. So I would say, you know, maybe it's worth trying to reduce the number of medications or the dosages, but I, I wouldn't be obsessed with trying to get off them. So this is a reminder to our listeners that integrative medicine is not anti-medication or right. anti-pharmaceutical yeah. approaches, especially in the case of uh, the blood pressure medicines. There's a really wide range. They tend to have, or you usually can find one that has minimal side effect for yep. you, and they are proven to prevent heart attacks and strokes. Yeah, I would say one of the great advances of conventional medicine over the past uh, 50, 60 years has been much better control of blood pressure. And I think that's one of the things that's accounted for the drop in incidence of heart attacks, especially and, and uh, strokes. I do want to add one thing, and that's that one factor that's sometimes not thought about is environmental chemicals. So for example, bisphenol A, which is in plastics, which we're regularly exposed to, can raise blood pressure. And so removing plastics and other environmental exposures might actually be something that tips this person or other people into a healthier blood pressure range. You mention in your book, Spontaneous Happiness, that there is a link between antihistamines and depression. Mm -hmm. My husband has a disposition which tends to lean on the more depressed side than the upbeat, joyful side. He takes Benadryl every night for sleep because it helps him sleep and it helps his allergies. Do you think this could be depressing his mood? I certainly do. And I also think uh, there's evidence that long-term use of Benadryl may actually increase the risk of dementia in later life. So I think this is something you want to get off of. Uh, there are certainly much better options for sleep. Uh, you know, my first choice would be valerian, the herb, uh, to see if he can substitute that for the Benadryl. And in terms of uh, allergy control, I don't know what the allergies are, but uh, I would take a look at the chapter on antihistamines in my book, Mind Over Meds. And there's a lot of uh, suggestions for integrative management of allergies. I couldn't agree more. I also would say that in terms of the antihistamines, Benadryl, which is in many of the sleep meds, is the worst. And some of the newer antihistamines aren't associated with that risk of dementia. Right. But they may, you know, they were supposed to be non-sedating, but in my experience, they still are. I mean, they still can cause a kind of grogginess and mental fogginess and probably not the best thing for mental health. 
Andy, this is a question on the health benefits of singing. And I know <laughs> that you are super fond of singing. I love to sing. I love to sing in groups. Uh, I think it can be a very joyful experience. And also, I have a friend who used to teach, or I have two friends actually, that used to teach workshops in, in singing and encountered many people who think they cannot sing. And often this stems from one experience early in life when somebody told them they couldn't sing and stuck with them all their life. And, and these people work from the premise that everybody can sing. I absolutely agree with that. I think it's a wonderful thing to do. Yes, I think it's one of the things that we have lost in the pandemic years, because early on we were told about uh, some spreading events, uh, but group singing can be just such a wonderful form of being in community. Okay, last question, and it's on supplements. Is there a good way to figure out which supplements one should be taking? I currently take about 15 a day, adding as I hear about a supplement that I could feel I could benefit from. I've heard or read the advice that taking unnecessary supplements is a waste of money. So how do you know? Well, I would say you consult an integrative practitioner, uh, ideally someone that we've trained at our center because uh, our education includes very good information on this subject. You can also look at my website, drweil.com, or my books like Healthy Aging and Eight Weeks to Optimum Health, which give advice about uh, recommended supplements. So I think you want a good, good guide to help you there. That's great advice. I, I think one other thing people can do is, you know, when you're on 15, you could say, let me try going off of that one for a while and see if I notice a difference. So for example, say you're taking uh, glucosamine and chondroitin for your joints and you go off for three or four weeks and you notice no change at all. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe you don't need that right at this yeah, point. Good idea. Well, Dr. Weil, as always, it's been wonderful to talk with you about all of these really common questions that we get asked. And I appreciate listeners uh, sending them to us. We will do another episode like this. So if your question did not get answered, or if you want to add a question into the mix, we welcome it. Listeners, this is Dr. Victoria Mazes. We would love for you to send us your questions for Andy, myself, or for our guests. You can call us and leave a voicemail by dialing 520-621-3950. Again, 520-621-3950. Or you can submit a question by going to our website, azcim.org slash podcast. Again, azcim.org slash podcast. We will review your questions and try to answer as many as possible on our programs. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Body of Wonder brought to you by the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine. If you like the show, please rate us five stars, follow the show, and leave a review. To learn more about Integrative Healing and the Center, go to azcim.org slash podcast. That's azcim.org slash podcast.